Hey everybody, welcome to the Morning Devo with Boa. Woo, that's sunny out there, isn't it? Man, it's bright. I gotta turn my blinds and shut that stuff, you know? But yeah, hold on, real quick. Woo, there we go, that's a little better, right? Absolutely, hey, it's uh, Boa's Devo, Devo with Boa, however you wanna say, the Morning Devo with Boa, right? But uh, welcome to the devotion today. It is August 18th, and uh, excited to just go over one chapter today. Yesterday we went over kind of three, we've been kind of going over a bunch and um, kind of getting through the book, but um, you know, now we're gonna kind of take it down a notch and just go to do one chapter kind of maybe just see how this thing ends and then meaning this time with Elihu and then we'll get into uh, next week we're going to get into the big kind of conclusion with God's response to all this I mean a lot's been said so you can always check out the archives at my YouTube channel, Bo Willette. Check those out. A lot of archives there um, and uh, a lot of books of the Bible. And glad you're able to go through it with me and just get focused. And a lot of times devotions are just times like that to get focused on Christ, get kind of your mind in the right spot. Of course, uh, the difference with my devotions is I'm a, definitely a product of SoCal life growing up. Um, and so definitely a product of my culture, French Canadian guy from Southern California. California. Um, always grew up uh, with hockey and uh, a hockey stick in my hand playing street hockey, of course, because my parents could not afford ice in Los Angeles. So back in the 70s. And so, hey, we played a lot of street hockey and I taught my friends Miggy Manuel and Juan all about it. And they never even seen hockey before. It was awesome. And um, boy, you know, but uh, anyway, big fan of KLOS back in the day, hence the two hip sticker down right there. And um, I don't know if you guys remember remembered KLOS, but that was a cool station back in the day, and I think they're still going now, but man, I always enjoyed the music and stuff like that, and um, you know, so I just, things that remind me of my past, and just in the sense of going, hey, God's brought me a long way, you know, uh, definitely a long way, grew up a secular atheist, all that, uh, definitely um, not uh, into Christianity whatsoever, and boy, lo and behold, right, this kid comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord, as Savior, as the one I want to listen to, not only for the life here, but in the life to come. So pretty important. Anyway, let's get into Job 37. Paula, thanks so much for correcting the chapters um, um, on the screen. It said Job uh, yesterday's uh, three chapters, but we are on just Job 37 today. So this is a continuation of Elihu's speaking to Job. It's the young boy making his comments known, right? And he says, here we go. Let's see what he lastly wants to say. My heart pounds as I think of this. It trembles within me. Listen carefully to the thunder of God's voice as it rolls from his mouth. Mouth. He's talking about the vastness, the greatness of God and how radical that is. And man, it just freaks Elihu out to think, who could challenge God with anything? Job, how can you even demand any time with God, wanting to talk to God? You know, I think of my culture and how many of the songs that I listened to growing up mocking God. Um, have you ever kind of heard songs that mocked God? Uh, especially they're talking about the God of the Bible. And, uh, you know, you might have heard songs like that before. And they seem all well and good and almost like an anthem of a generation, you know. But yet... Um, you know, when Elihu hears Job talk, he senses that Job thinks that he could have this day in court with the Almighty, uh, which is to Elihu is just an absolute ridiculous logical uh, statement. How can someone have a moment with the deity and live? How can someone get into the presence or be in the presence of God and actually survive? And this is something that is seen throughout the whole Bible, right? Is that whenever God is on the scene, it, 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 whenever God's glory shows up, God's presence shows up, there is a, in a sense, a incredible fear and a panic, if you will, at the disco, you know? There's a panic that goes on, a real freaking out of 
you know, the people. And that makes sense, right? Elihu understands this. God is righteous. Humans aren't. You, you know, you turn on the light in a room and darkness goes away. We're darkness, God's light. That, you know, in Elihu's mind, Job, you can't be saying these kind of things, man. You can't think that you can just, you know, come into light and not see your darkness go away. You know, and there's some, there's some action to that going away. You know, you will die kind of thing. But uh, our, a lot of our generations are kind of, whether you grew up in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s or 90s, whatever generation, there's always those kind of songs that kind of mock God. They think, you think like, oh, God, I, I kind of got one over on you. I really know more than you. Oh, really, you're foolish. Oh, really, blah, blah, blah. You know, that kind of idea. And that's common. You know, it just what all it shows is that we as human beings are super ignorant. We just, we just are lost people. That's what it shows me. It shows me and my generation that we just had no clue what we were doing. Um, we were like just, you know, rats, man, in a, in a big old maze, just running around, man. And if someone put some cheese somewhere, we would go over there. If someone put cheese over there, we'd run over there. We just went where our fleshly desires dictated. That's kind of what we did, man. Pretty sad. So he's kind of blown away at Job. And Job's audacity, you know, uh, to want this time with the Almighty. It says it rolls across the heavens and his lightning flashes in every direction. Then comes the roaring of the thunder, the tremendous voice of his majesty. He does not restrain it when he speaks. God's voice is glorious in it, the thunder. We can't even imagine the greatness of his power. That's true. You can't imagine the greatness of his power. Can you imagine infinite power? I was in the North Ridge earthquake. And uh, I can't even fathom that. I was on the epicenter, Nordoff and Reseda, in 1994, January, I think maybe 14th. But when that thing hit at around 4.30 a.m., the ground didn't rumble. It didn't like, jugger, 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 jugger. it jackhammered. Like the biggest jackhammer you've ever seen in your life. It was like King Kong had a jackhammer underneath the apartment. And he turned it on full full steam. It was unbelievable, the power. My brain literally went tilt. And this is what happens. Humans can only take, our brains can only comprehend certain things. It, it, it can only go so far. And then we can't quite understand the greatness, the bigness, the vastness, the power, the energy, the speed. We can't take those things in. We, we don't know how to process them. There's like a limited capacity that we have as the human beings that we are. And if you've ever been in a natural disaster, you might have had this experience where you get to a certain place uh, of time in the natural disaster and then your brain kind of goes on a little bit of a tilt where you can't co quite remember everything it's too amazing now this is how Elihu describes God as being this kind of powerful almighty amazing like a natural disaster like a natural phenomenon that you just can't quite understand and in, in a sense that's true when it comes to God there is, a, in a sense, a knowledge of God that we're only going to be able to reach, you know, and then we're not going to go any further. Um, not with these eyes, not with these ears, not with this brain, not with this body. We will need, in a sense, a resurrected eye and a resurrected ear and a resurrected brain to be able to comprehend God. Pretty cool. So... And it says, God's voice is glorious. We got that in verse 5. Verse 6 says, He directs the snow to fall on the earth and tells the rain to pour down. Then everyone stops working so they can watch his power. The wild animals take cover and stay inside their dens. That's so true. He's just observing the way nature works and God's power in dictating all the natural laws and the way things work. He says, uh, verse 9, the stormy wind comes from the, the chamber and the driving winds bring the cold. God's breath sends the ice. Ooh, ooh. Freezing wide expanses of water. He loads the clouds with moisture and they flash with his lightning. Uh, 
The clouds churn about at the direct at his direction. They do whatever he commands throughout the earth. He makes these things happen either to punish people or to show his unfailing love. Hmm, God's got a way of using the natural things to either deal with people or to show them unfailing love. This is a big theme throughout religions of the world. Is God punishing you? Oh, natural disaster came. Sure is. You know, oh, the sun's shining. Things are growing. Oh, he loves you. You know, this kind of idea, right? You know, and this is something that's common amongst many different uh, groups of people. You know, even people that are atheists, we tend to think this way, right? The disaster comes, man, dude, like negative energy. You know, we're into the energies. You know, have you ever heard someone into talking about energy? That's a negative energy, man. You know, God. And then, oh, it's so positive energy. So much springtime. Nice, positive energy. Oh, I like that. You know, people talk that way, right, all the time. And he makes these things happen either to punish people or to show his unfailing love. Pay attention to this, Job. Stop and consider this wonderful miracle of God. How do you know how God controls the storm and causes the lightning to flash from the clouds? Do you understand how he moves the clouds with wonderful perfection and skill? He says, come on, you don't understand everything. How can you even have a moment with the Lord? How can you even come into his presence? Now, by the way, the New Testament says, and this is the cool work of Jesus. Jesus says he's the door. He's the door to the Father. So this, this, in a sense, chasm between us and a holy God has been bridged. It's been opened, right? There's a bridge now to get from us to God, and that's the way of Jesus. Jesus is the stairway to heaven as Led Zeppelin said, right? Even though I don't think they were talking about Jesus. But, you know, you get the picture. That's the idea. Jesus says, hey, I'm the ladder. I'm the ladder. I'm the one who you you climb me to get to the Father. That's how it works. I am the door. And so the New Testament declares that we, those who trust in his covering, his forgiveness of sins towards us, we can now come boldly to this deity that seems so distant and so amazingly powerful. We can now come to him freely by grace. Oh, man, think of that this morning. You can come to the person Elihu is talking about where our brains go tilt. We can go there by grace. We don't have to fear. Elihu's talking like you, if you have this moment with God, man, you better fear because he is powerful. He's dictated all things. Who can fathom him? So true. But Jesus has made a way for us to know God personally through knowing his son. As we know the Son, so we get to know who? The Father. We know the characteristics of the Father by knowing the Son. The Son is a reflection, the image of the invisible God. That's what Colossians says, the book of Colossians in the New Testament. God is the image of the invisible God. He is the fullness of God in bodily form. He is the fullness of God in bodily form and whom we are complete in. Whoa, pretty radical, right? Man, I've been made complete. I've been put back together, you know, by this wonderful son who is now revealed the father. So you can see how Elihu's talking like, man, we need that middle person because boy, we are in trouble when it comes to talking about God. You know, I hate Elihu says, hey, my culture mocks God. My culture thinks that, oh, yeah, I can have time with God. Oh, yeah. You know, God's lame. Oh, God's this. God's that. You know, God, you know, put down God. Ha ha ha. You know, I certainly did, too. You know, but, you know, when the chips are down and you're dying and there's no one to help you and you're breathing your last breath. Yeah, you'll see how powerless you are. And you'll see how you are inept. Your strength, your power, your stamina, your mental capabilities, nothing will help on that day. Nothing. Right? No. You're going to need a power greater than yourself. And that power is not some ethereal power. 
Eli who's talking about that power. It is the true and living God. And this is who Jesus has come to reveal, right? Not to not some ethereal God, but the actual God, true and living God. Wow. Very cool, huh? Awesome. Super cool stuff, I must say. So let's see, where are we at? Um, let's see. Verse two, 17. When you are sweltering in your clothes. Oh, man. Does that feel like today, by the way? Does that feel like this last week? Sweltering in your clothes? Raise your hand if you have sweated more the last month than you have in the last year or two. I mean, is that unbelievable? It's like sweating season out there right now. Woo, humid, hot, baking. And it says, when you are sweltering in your clothes and the south wind dies down and everything is still, he makes the skies reflect the heat like a bronze mirror. Can you do that? Oh, man, I was riding the bike the other day and I was going across Gates Pass and I had to go pick up some mail and the sun was hitting the clouds and bouncing off those clouds, smacking me. And it, it felt like 120 degrees. It was awesome. I mean, I loved it. I did. I thought it was so cool. It was so sweaty. I, I was like, I, I was like in a sweat lodge or something. It was baking. You know, I was just kicking back in a sweat. Full downpour. And I guess I was cleansing myself, right? <laughs> of all those impurities. And it says, so teach the rest of us what to say to God. Uh, uh, we are too ignorant to make our own arguments. Should God be notified that I want to speak? Can people even speak when they are confused? We cannot look at the sun, for it shines brightly in the sky when the wind clears away the clouds. So also golden splendor comes from the mountain of God. He is clothed in dazzling splendor. We cannot imagine the power of the Almighty, but even though he is just and righteous, he does not destroy us. No wonder people everywhere fear him, for all who are wise show him reverence. There's Elihu who's big complaint. Uh, Job, you're not being that reverent, bro. God's just. God's righteous. Look at how you're acting. You want this time with God. Don't you know you can't even look at the sun? You look at the sun, you'll be blinded. What do you think if you look at the deity? What's going to happen when you see God? Wow. So this morning, you know, we thank Jesus for being that bridge. Oh, that's great. I mean, Elihu really paints a great picture of who God is in his justice and righteousness, his splendor, his majesty. You might have heard that term. Majesty, worship is majesty. You might have heard that worship song. You know, it, you know that splendor that Elihu's talking about. But boy, how can we come into the presence of that splendor? It's hard to do. But Jesus is that bridge. He is that door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And you know what? You might see, think like you're a dud. You might think like, man, there's no way that you can come into the presence of God. Think of everything you've done. Think of what's in your mind. Think of, you know, all the failures that you have in your life. And you go, how can I even come into the presence of something, of someone whose splendor like is like that, whose majesty is like that, who's perfect in righteousness and justice? And the answer is you can't. But you can through the work of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus has come to do. He's come to take that burden that Elihu feels. Elihu feels that heavy burden that who can come into the presence of the Lord. And Jesus says, come to me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest, right? Take my yoke upon me. Come to me. You know, I want to give you a yoke that's easy, right? Those yoke that held the oxen together, that was around their necks, keeping them focused, right? I want to give you a yoke that is easy. It's not so nagging to your neck. It doesn't bother you, but that's free. And, you know, do you find in Jesus you have that beautiful just freedom, that freedom to approach God? Hmm. That's amazing. You know, so cool, right? So Elihu paints the picture. He lets, you know, lets Job know what he thinks. He's a young man. He's the young pastor. And so next week, we'll see what God's going to say. Ho, ho, ho. It's going to be cool, right? Uh, so exciting. So let me see your comments. I haven't looked at them yet. Hey, Casey says, good morning. And and Paula says, um, uh, nature sauna. So true. Um, Scott says, awesome study. Thanks, brother. 
Um, so re really cool stuff, fun study for sure, you know, totally neat. Um, you know, again, when you think of Job, uh, this, this last section, uh, or this, you know, these big dialogues, just remember, there's a lot of things that are said that are true, but they're just not true in the right context. And so, um, that's the biggie, you know, we really need to discern what we say and we see that, you know, there's elders that share and you know and sometimes they share wrongly and sometimes there's young people like Elihu that share and and they think they got it all licked as well but they kind of don't either they might say all say good things and great spiritual things and great theological things but really there's nothing to say in Job's grief you know sometimes it's just like I say holding the hand or praying so anyway I'm off to the hospital myself to go visit someone I'm not going to give them a big speech like Elihu. I'm not going to go at them at this person like the three elders of Job. Instead, I might just smile and pray and hold their hand. So you guys have a great one. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.